everybody. So welcome to another edition of Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase Winter Edition, where I go through some of the cool tools and services that are out there so that you don't necessarily have to reach out to that salesperson unless you really want to. All right. And these are all my honest review. These are not sponsored. And if I miss something that you really want to see reviewed, make sure you link it down below. And today we are actually going to be talking to one of the experts in the field. Uh, he was one of the first recognizable names in this space to me when I was newly minted uh, into the Knowledge Graph space. And that is Seth Early, who has a whole company all on his own. We're going to be talking to him today to understand what does his company offer as services in the Knowledge Graph community and a few other data things. So with that, keep on watching. Nice to be here, Ashley. I know you, we've known each other for a number of years, and uh, thank you for the wonderful, kind words. Um, so I've uh, been in the industry for over 25 years. I've, um, I'm founder and CEO of Early Information Science, uh, which is a professional services firm that helps organizations make their information more usable, more valuable, and more findable. Or it might be more findable, more usable, more valuable. Or it might be more valuable, usable. you get the picture. It's yeah. any of those combinations. But yeah. we help yeah. make better use of information. Some, sometimes that entails uh, e-commerce initiatives. So we do a lot of work in product data and product information architecture, product information management. We do work in uh, content, content optimization, content operations. Uh, we also do work in customer data and customer engagement. So normalizing customer data, cleansing, and also uh, building attribute models. There's a lot of work these days that marketers are, are undertaking to build rich profile data because of the loss of um, information from things like cookies uh, for tracking and third-party data. So organizations need to build that first-party data. And then knowledge, knowledge architecture, knowledge engineering, which includes uh, things like semantic search, but it also includes uh, things like componentization of knowledge to power things like chatbots and mm -hmm. uh, virtual assistants. So that's kind of a broad area of uh, a range of, of possibilities. We have about 50 consultants. Uh, that's uh, full time plus a mm -hmm. uh, contract uh, pool that we use quite extensively, kind of like full time people. And then we can scale up to as many as 100 if we need to. Uh, yeah. So that's it. And we've worked across industries, a lot of Fortune 500, a lot of Fortune 1000 organizations. Many times they're large, complex, uh, multi-year initiatives, uh, mm -hmm. many times there are other agencies, other consultants, other vendors, global in scale, complex, lots of, uh, lots of uh, um, nooks and crannies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Seth, that is a wide ranging, but very consistent, right? Everything that you're talking about ties back to the data, right? And I think a lot of people that are not familiar or they're maybe just getting into the larger data sphere, um, maybe they're taxonomists coming in. I know a lot of people on, on the channel are, are coming in from that direction or master data management and things like that. Though, yes, that's data, that's, that's certainly data. And I know that you cover those things as well, but there's the usage analytics, right? And how do you actually make sense of the data that you are gathering? And sometimes, even if you have great data, which most of us don't, but even when you do, imagine having- you, Imagine you had great data. <laughs> yeah, ima imagine you do, right? Because none, none of us really do. Um, some of us have little pockets <laughs> that we've developed over the years, but it's it's how to actually derive insights from that, which I think is the specialness that we're all trying to get to. And you know, if you are one of those big companies that has a whole analytics team, kudos to you, but not all of us have that, right? right. And so if folks are trying to develop the insights from their data or they need help figuring out what kind of insights that they can get. That sounds like something that you folks can help with as well. well oh, thank you for mentioning that. I mean, one of the things we <clears throat> excuse me, talk about is the fact that all of the work we, we do is tied together by metrics driven governance. And I know <laughs> governance is a bad word many in many cases. If people <laughs> agree, it's not it's not shiny, it's not fancy, it's not shiny, it's not fun, but it's very necessary. I know uh, it's hard to get people to attend mm -hmm. uh, meetings and workshops. You know, you they'll they'll uh, look at the invite and go, "Oh, governance. Hmm. How about never? Never works. <laughs> never work for you. I have never available." So yeah. you know, 
hard to get people to do that. But what, what you can do is you can tie it to measures and metrics and KPIs yeah. that are important to them. Right. And that really is the only way to get the attention of the organization is to is to manage your results, measure your results, measure your baselines, and then measure the impact of whatever remediation you're doing. And every single project should always start with what is the outcome, what does yeah. success look like, and how do we measure it? And even bring in people from finance to say, mm -hmm. bless this, you know, bless this. Tell yeah. me if this yeah. makes sense. Is this going to hold water, you know, with leadership? And they'll yeah. say no, or they'll say yes, that works. <laughs> So bring them in in advance, look at what you're measuring, ask people, what, how is this going to impact your day-to-day? -day? How is this going to impact your job? How is this going to impact the customer? And how do we measure it today? And it may be that they don't have the instrumentation to do that, but, yeah. that, but that calls out the need to find that mechanism to measure. Because yeah. if you don't have the measures, who is going to, to <laughs> make this successful? Here's what happens. Here's what happens. <clears throat> you get 10 different projects. Suddenly there's a... There's a great success, you know, we increased revenue or we uh, reduced churn or we mm, did, mm -hmm. did that, whatever it is. And then 10 projects jump onto that and take credit, <laughs> right? Everybody takes credit. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was the project. Oh, that was our project. That was uh -huh. our project. So what, what you need to do is say, what are the unique measures and mm. what is the linkage between yes. specifically what we're doing and the outcome? And then you can take full credit for it because you are instrumenting it and you are putting in place the right metrics and you're, yeah. you're asking the right questions early on in the discussion. And and I think that, that that's really a, 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 a unfortunately secret that a lot of people don't always pick up on. I think that, um, I say this quite a bit, I have a passion for this area, right? And I get very fired up and I sometimes have uh, a disconnect. You're a true geek. You are a true geek. A geek <laughs> I am a true geek. I am that I am. <laughs> uh, those that are like me, we have to realize our job is not to pass on our passion for what we're doing to our business stakeholders. <laughs> that would be lovely. However, um, what we need to do is take that passion and harness it into understanding what is going to be meaningful to to my uh, end user or to my business partners. And you're not always going to save money or save churn or save it the very first year. That's that's the other thing that I think people have to keep in mind is sometimes you have to do a two or three year time frame where you say sometimes you have to spend money to save money. People mm -hmm. hate that saying, but oftentimes it's going to take resources. You have this this right. moment in time where you're trying to get stakeholder buy-in and they're saying, well, wait a minute, you're asking me to, to, to buy into this data cleanup project or, you know, creating a data fabric or, you know, whatever it is that you're looking at. And I, you said something that's very important that I say in a lot of my other videos, but it's a good thing to highlight. And that is people are oftentimes uh, not put into this equation, right? So how much time does it take? If you have one analyst and that analyst can be doing a lot of other things and it takes them, let's say three hours to run that report for you. That's not bad at all. Okay. But what if they have to do that every day or every week that adds up and, and their, their, their time, right? You're paying for their time. So you eventually get a price tag on each query, each, you know, analytic thing that you're doing. And you have to measure that against the other things, the opportunity costs. What other things can, a, can they not work on because you have to have them do that all the time? And that does become difficult. That, that calculus becomes difficult mm. because a lot of executives will say, well, saving a few minutes here and there, yes, it does add up. Yes, there are cascading effects. Yes, mm -hmm. there are implications throughout the organization. And it's, it's almost like you're removing friction from processes, right? You're mm -hmm. just... Mm -hmm. Like I like to say, you're speeding up the information metabolism. Of the <laughs> That's nice. Because all organizations do is take in information, mm -hmm. put out information, and even mm -hmm. if you make products, you know, think about this. This my magical device. I call this my magical device, right? My <laughs> it's made of sand, oil, and metal, all yeah. very cleverly arranged. <laughs> right? Nice. A lot of yeah. knowledge. A lot of knowledge, but it it but it is but all we do is process information and knowledge yeah. and data and content. Yeah. And the point is, the faster we can take that information in mm -hmm. and act on it and respond to market changes and respond to customer mm -hmm. needs, the mm -hmm. 
the faster we can do business, the faster, the more agile we are. And a lot of organizations are just bogged down by antiquated digital machinery yes. that has enormous amounts of technical debt. And yeah. so when they want to make changes and they want to be responsive, they can't. So when you talk about the, that, those little savings, they do add up, yeah. but here's the problem. The problem is many executives don't buy that argument. And the reason they don't buy that argument is say, it's, it's your opportunity cost, if you can quantify that. Mm -hmm. But they'll say, okay, they're, all these people are gonna save a little bit more time. Well, what are they gonna do with that time? Can mm -hmm. I reduce that count? Can I actually get uh, other stuff done? I mean, it, it, yeah. it, or are they just gonna spend more time, you know, talking around the water cooler well, I think that that's that's a yeah, that's a different type of problem, though. I mean, normally um, at all the organizations I've ever worked at, there are more projects to do than people that to do them. Can do that. I understand. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so normally. Yeah. <laughs> but it has to be very tangibly measurable. Now, yeah. we did a project for applied materials that actually made it into a uh, special topic issue um, of Harvard Business Review that's actually mm -hmm. out this month on artificial intelligence, and it was about mm -hmm. is your data infrastructure ready for AI? You can actually get <laughs> site as well. But um, <clears throat> but at Applied Materials, we actually reduced the amount of time that field service engineers were spending looking for information mm -hmm. by 50%. They were spending 40% of their time. So they were spending uh, uh, 16 hours per week. We reduced it to eight hours. And we did that in a measurable way across 3,000 field service reps. So the mm -hmm. timesheets reflected that, everything mm -hmm. reflected that the attrition, they were able to look at that and say, wow, this is real. We can document this. So that yeah. kind of saving was really super important and it was yeah. very measurable and it was very tangible. So you yeah. have to find the same equation in the organization. Yeah. Yes, that one person may be spending three hours. That's a big bit of time. But then look at all the related processes. Look at who yeah. else is impacted. Yeah, it's it's the full <laughs> ecosystem, right? That's what you're talking about. And, and speaking of ecosystem, one thing that I have also seen people say is, we just have to get to the cloud. That'll fix it. it <laughs> we could just go so much faster in the cloud. That is not going to fix your problems. <laughs> in fact, um, what a lot of people don't, I think, realize is if you take your gnarly mess of things mm -hmm. and you put it up into the cloud and it's, you it's a cloud it's, full of gnarly, messy things. Exactly. And you're actually going to be spending most likely more money if it's up in the cloud and it's still a gnarly mess. Now, I will say sometimes it is easier to do a lift and shift to yep. be able to get the agility to fix the things that you might not be able to fix on prem that is a different use case but i do often hear people say as long as we can get to the cloud we're going to be there it's going to be great yeah. it is not a uh fix for everything <laughs> yeah the opportunity to move to the cloud has to be a, a catalyst for uh for doing things like rationalization of your technology mm -hmm. stack and mm -hmm and normalization and all those or micro architectures or other things that we know do improve your efficiency do improve your throughput there's a lot of great tools on cloud architecture that you can use you know like we're talking about you know some machine learning aspects here you know comprehend is a fabulous tool um some of the other things that you can use in SageMaker, you know and i'm an aws shop so i know them the most but azure has a ton of fabulous Oh, you yeah. know, machine learning algorithms, GPT-3, all of that is is great. And all right, so Seth, I know some other things that you have uh, written, there's a lot of blogs out there, on your take on AI and how it plays into this field. And uh, what's, you take a really interesting combination is you talk about artificial intelligence programs for your digital transformation, right? You take two ambiguous concepts, yeah. you put yeah. them together. Yeah. I recently wrote an article about 10 pitfalls and 10 mm -hmm. things, 10 tips to avoid problems with digital transformation with AI. And the mm -hmm. primary one is to really focus not on the technology, but on the business problem, right? Yep. And understand the process that you're trying to enable. And it's understand- It's another thing in your toolbox, right? Right, it's another tool in your toolbox. And, 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 and uh, it, it aids humans in doing their jobs, but you yep. can't automate a mess and you can't automate what you don't understand. <laughs> Yeah. You have to start with that understanding of that yeah. process. No yeah. AI is going to figure out your process for you. Yeah. A lot of vendors say, oh, you just use our process. It really has to be about your process. Exactly. Exactly. So on. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's actually a great red flag to, mm. oh, to look yeah. for is, you know, if you don't have a good smell test of your own, listen for that, that phrase. Oh, our stuff will fix X. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay, well, but that means they're going to fix it their way, and mm -hmm. that might not be meeting your needs, right? And so, um, you know, it was a very popular thing for for a time, which is Watson. People were like, yeah, Watson AI, we're going to do it. We're... It was a black box. So yeah. people had a really hard time. I remember you had to literally call one of the engineers um, mm -hmm. that worked at Watson to, to update the model for you. And it's like, that's not effective. Yeah. Um, so I think that we've we've all kind of wisened up a little bit more uh, to that. Not not any disrespect to those using or doing things with Watson, but you know it is a better approach to make sure that it's not only black box that you can actually make sure that it's working exactly how you need it to work for your use case. Yeah, and when you think about uh, uh, adopting a tool that someone else has built that has let's say a generic uh, language model or is tuned on you know, some some data model and it's going to give you some great efficiency, that's fine. You know, standardization will give you efficiency, but differentiation gives you competitive advantage. So you can't necessarily take something off the shelf and call that your competitive advantage if everybody else can do that. And, you know, one of the things that you need to ask vendors is how did you train your model? Exactly. Source and yep. why did you choose AI and why did you choose this particular model? And then mm -hmm. a lot need to be up and how what data do we need to train the ai and then mm -hmm. how do we need to do that so you do have to ask those questions and you have to dig in a little more deeply and look for the roi you know what is your what roi have your customers achieved yep. and 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 then do things in terms of a poc or a pilot or whatever demo with your data with your use mm -hmm. cases not theirs because everything demos well with their data everything absolutely demos well in yep. powerpoint right yep. <laughs> so, so yeah. use your data, use your use. Yeah. And that's the problem too. You know, everything in, in the early part of, uh, well, in the early 2000s, when, when people were doing AI, uh, the, the general thinking was, you know, AI generally doesn't work because as soon as it works, you call it something else. Like you call it spell check, call it word processing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. processing was one of the first incarnations of AI because it took yeah. human judgment and it applied with these algorithms. But now, these days, everything is AI, right? Because it's sexy now. <laughs> Everybody has AI. And yeah. so you really do have to tease that apart because it's yeah. become less meaningful, right? And yeah. it's just it's just going to be called programming. <laughs> you know, it's... it's yeah. I, I remember talking to vendors, you know, years ago who would say, I'd say, well, tell me about what you need for, you know, data or inputs or this or that. And you go, oh, our algorithm does it all. Oh, it does it all. <laughs> we, we have machine learning, uh, n-dimensional free space factors with backward propagation, yeah. deep neural networks, and all of that will do everything. You don't even have to figure out the process. And it's like, bye-bye, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it was just yeah. a little buzzword strung together yeah. that had the meaning. Yeah, and what are the inputs and what are the outputs? Like, what are you yeah. trying to, what is it trying to accomplish and what's the business value? Like, what yeah. do you, that should all be understandable. Like, what yeah. do you need to be successful? What do you need as inputs? And then what is it doing? You know, so it, I, I, people hide a lot behind, uh, oh, it's proprietary. Oh, it's this, right. oh, it's that. Yeah. It's like, you know, they got, they have to be able to explain it to you in some yeah. way that makes yep. sense. It doesn't Explainable make Explainable AI. But the business person should be able to, understand it you should be able yeah. to explain in in terms of, of of what they're getting what they need to do how it's at a high level you got to be able to do that and do it without jargon yeah absolutely and i i like to keep this a, a jargon free as much as possible or at least use the jargon in relatable ways <laughs> space for us so seth it I, you i think have proven that uh your consultancy the the way that you do things is is probably very in line with the things that we were talking about today so for those that would want to learn more about what you do or get in contact with you to find out about partnering up how would they go about doing that well, they can certainly reach me uh, uh, at Seth, S-E-T-H, at early, E-A-R-L-E-Y, don't forget the E before the Y, dot com. So just my first name at last name dot com. You can go to early.com, that's E-A-R-L-E-Y, don't forget the E before the Y again. Uh, and that's our website. And uh, and you can take, take check out my book. Uh, yes. It's called AI Powered Enterprise, and the subtitle is Harness the Power of Ontologies to Make Your Business Smarter, faster and more profitable. And I try to explain things. This is more of a business book. And that's what Good. people, yeah. sometimes the people from the uh, AI space say, well, it was more about, you know, 
what you need to be successful or what you need around it or you know the foundation and, and the business problems it wasn't really about ai and i that's exactly what i was trying for exactly and i exactly this, we need more of that 